a soldier, an airman, and a marine walk into a room. This show is The Punchline. My name is Ryan Smeltz, and you're watching Veteran Talk Show. All right, guys, so in case you don't know, we are an affiliate for Soldier Girl Coffee Company. I'm super excited about this because they have amazing coffee, and in future episodes, you will see us drinking soldier girl coffee uh they also have a cbd coffee so if uh you need um some cbd uh which helps support um your health in a sense of relaxation uh it helps uh with your your sleep and your overall health on a day-to-day basis then soldier girl coffee has both that and the caffeine you need uh, so be sure to check out the link in the show notes. Uh, go ahead and click that, shop around, and make sure you get yourself some Soldier Girl coffee today. I'm really interested in the, the cows. And the reason okay. is because we talked, uh, my sister was just in town, so we talked about how you can like go to a local farm. Mm-hmm. And I've talked with my fiance about this. Mm-hmm. And you get a cow, and then you call the butcher. So it gets delivered and cut mm-hmm. up, and you add for your cuts, and then you go pick it up. The issue that we have, me and my fiance, is we don't have a deep freezer. Mm-hmm. So we would get this much of a cow. Yeah, yeah. So, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people have that issue, and that's kind of where um, I wanted to kind of answer to that, you know, or kind of be, kind of be that filler. Yeah. Um, currently... Uh, what we do is I don't really feel too many of them, you know, buy half a cow, buy a quarter of a cow, buy a whole cow. And the reason for that is, is that, you know, you end up doing and you do it in on agreement or you do it on a handshake or you collect a deposit even. And then once it comes time for it to be slaughtered and it's processed and all that kind of stuff, a lot of people don't realize how much it costs. You're talking a couple thousand dollars and you got to worry about storing it and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> it takes you a damn year to oh, wait. I can cuss on this, right? It, 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 it don't matter. Yeah, you, you, it takes you a damn year to damn, you know, eat it all, yeah. which is good, yeah. you know, but stuff only lasts so long. You know, the stuff gets banged around and, you know, uh, the vacuum seals break and all that kind of stuff. You can run into all kinds of issues. So, what we do is a lot of times on our Facebook page, we take and um, we put out our price list and we'll run an ad or something like that. And we focus on buy by the pound as however much you need, however much will make it last for, you know, how much, however much space you have. Um, and hell, I'll even come deliver it to you. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've done well. And we kind of started... You said buy by the pound. Yeah, yeah. So, so how how does that work from your standpoint? Because you can't kill half a cow. You're absolutely right. So uh, how does that work if you like, you know? Yeah, so so let's say um so I kind of have a schedule. So I'll, I'll let people know like we're getting ready to go to, go to slaughter January 31st. I can I let people know it's coming up and I said here's what I'll have, you know, because at the processor and we can't process anything on our on on our property we're a usda mm-hmm. uh license facility we have licensing and it would be a fine for us to do it so it goes to a processor and they have a cut sheet and so i'll get say i want ribeyes t-bones all that kind of stuff and um and right after it takes about two weeks three weeks to pick it till you pick it up once it gets processed I put in all the money and then I put it out after about three weeks and I say, here's what we have. You know, if you want a T-bone, because some people don't like, you know, the uh, chuck roast and all that kind of stuff. Um, Or they don't like the stew beef that you always get. And, you know, it ends up sitting in the freezer forever. With us, you can just order exactly what you want. You you say, okay, I want 20 pounds of ribeyes. I want 20 pounds of T-bones. A lot of times we can make that kind of stuff happen. And uh, granted, we are a small farm. Um, but, you know, we try to process every month, every other month. Um, and we our inventory is constantly changing. 
um, our cows and our hogs are raised on nothing but the finest grain. And the reason for that is even the hog, even when it comes to the hogs, um, I didn't want to just feed them slop. You know, in, initially all this was just for me to feed my family. And um, when COVID happened, and I'm not going to feed my family a damn hog that's been a trash. And just, not, <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, so when COVID hit, you know, all my friends, everybody I knew was running out of meat. And so I was like, and you couldn't find any. So I was like, well, I've got hogs on hoof right now. Just, we'll just get them processed and I'll help people out and we'll get it taken care of. Yeah, you know, that's the way we are. We're supposed to be is you look out for each other. And, um, and uh, so from there, it kind of took off. People liked what we were doing. I, 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 you, back when I lived in California, um, and I'm from Virginia, but I lived out, I moved out to California and now I'm back in North Carolina. I've made a whole full circle, but, uh, I grew tomatoes there. I grew, uh, tomatoes, cucumbers, um, just about anything you could want inside of a greenhouse. I've been doing it for 10 plus years. You know, I love it. It's my life. Um, I've got a passion for it. I've got a passion for uh, raising clean food. And because I have a, me and my family, we have this huge belief. And I wouldn't even say it's belief I, that, that what you put in is what you get out, you yeah. know? And if you're putting trash in your body, that's all you're going to get out. You're not going to be healthy. And, uh, you know, so it ended up taking off and people really liked it. And they just kept calling. And so we started, we went from, we started with just having a couple of chickens and a couple of goats and someone gave me some hogs. And uh, from there, because then I wanted to be around about, you know, one stop shop. Okay, you want your, you want your pork, you want your, your beef, we'll get you covered. We got you covered for all the holidays. If there's something you want, you, you know, because uh, I always go to slaughter right before the hot, right before the holidays, and you can say, okay, well, I want you know a brisket. I want you know, um, you know, really any cut you could think of. I think right now one of the popular ones is picanha, um, which is a top sirloin cut, uh, just with about an inch and a half layer of fat. We we do stuff like that. Um, it's really really trying to be quite personable. Every single person, every customer is, I hand deliver everything. We're looking into uh, mailing it, you know, but right now the shipping costs are so expensive. <laughs> and to be honest with you, I can't I hardly trust that, you know, the UPS or whatever shipping service that we're using is not gonna let our customers down. And I can't, in good conscience, charge someone, you know, 50, 60 bucks just to send them a couple pounds of sausage because shipping is expensive, you know? Right. And so, um, so yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of how we, it's kind of how we started and that's kind of what we're doing. Um, we do grain feed everything. And the reason for that is, um, and the, you know, the big, big argument, big thing that people like these days is, you know, grass fed, grass fed, grass fed, grass fed. Well, grass fed tastes like hay because that's what it consumes. You know, and if you think about it, if you're a vegan, if you're um, vegetarian, whatever, you know, or, or if you're you know, just really a clean eater or if you work out, you're going to put vitamins into your body. You're going to do stuff you know, that are all natural, you know, um, like, uh, there's, I take, personally, I take on it, which is all mushroom supplements, stuff like that. And, um, so I got down chemically, you know, what, what does a cow and a hog require to grow, you know, high protein, fiber, stuff like that. Um, you can't starve them with that, with that stuff. And 
you'll notice on our meat, the fat content and the marbling, even on our hogs, is just beautiful. So basically, grass-fed yeah. doesn't necessarily have those nutrients for the animal. I don't believe so. Um, to be completely honest with you, you, you have to... You, you have to give them something else. You know, Nat, you've got to, other than a salad, you've got to eat something else, yeah. you know? And um, <clears throat> so I, I honestly don't believe so. And you know, we don't, we're not adding, you know, trans fats. We're not, everything, when it leaves, it leaves on hoof and it comes back in a vacuum sealed bag. Nothing has been added to it. Nothing has been taken away. It, it, it you can taste the iron in the meat, you know, and which is to me is an amazing thing, um, and how fresh it is, you know. And um, I will say this, you know, a lot of people the argument as of late has been, well, you know, these prices are really expensive, and I don't really, you know, we charge like five dollars a pound for a pound of hamburger, and um, we. Does you know, I have to the fuel to get that animal to the processor, the fuel to go get feed, the fuel to go get hay, you know, because we do feed them hay. And um, the all of that adds up. And we're a small town farm and we're trying to serve our local community. And so um, we're not Walmart, we're not Food Line. We can't send you, sell you a $2 a pound. You know, thing of of hamburger, and just it, it, we would lose money, and, and I'm not in it to lose money. I'm not necessarily in it to make a whole lot. I don't, I don't, I don't care about getting rich. I care about providing good quality food. And um, well, I mean, yeah, I I shop by price mm -hmm. in the grocery store mm -hmm. or in I I would I would say Walmart, but I haven't. Dude, I haven't been to Walmart so long. Yeah. But yeah. but in the grocery store, and we uh I live right in the middle of the city, so I use Instacart, so I'm on there, and that's when I'm looking at the numbers. Yeah. But I'm a big beer guy. Yep. Um I like cigars. Yep. Uh I'm pretty big on on whiskey, mm -hmm. steak. Yep. When I go to get those things for the quality. Mm -hmm. of the drink of the tobacco of yep. the meat um i'm no longer looking at the price yeah exactly. now i'm assessing yeah. it's much like um uh i just had an army veteran on mm -hmm. um kurt ballish of ballish woodworks yep he's got a coffee table in his shop and he told me uh the wood around the edge of it i guess technically you would call it the trim mm -hmm. now you're you're talking about a table that's like you know, maybe this big around. Yep. It's it's not that big, but uh and he said the wood around the edge I think was called Babinga. Oh yeah. Never, never even heard of it. Never heard of it. Um I think he said it's priced at about five thousand dollars. Yeah. Cause you're talking about that handcrafted, skilled work High like quality. The, Absolutely. the type of people that go to him are the ones that custom built their home mm -hmm. and they say we want mm -hmm. an island here mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. not the one from home depot absolutely so at the end of the day like people aren't coming to you for the no, prices they're no. coming for the quality of the meat and they were, yes uh but i would also like to get it to where you know we can get our prices a little bit more amenable um so, so that I don't want to say, you know, I don't want to put anybody in a class. You know, anybody can feel like they can afford it. Um, and with the raising inflation and everything that's happening right now, I, everybody's prices are going to continue to go up, continue to go up, continue to go up. And I can guarantee you this because it's important to me. It's important to be, to provide good quality meat. And it's, in, it's important to me to take care of people. Is that we're not going to raise our prices just because everyone else is raising their prices. If I'm, if my prices haven't gone, you know, if I haven't had to put more into the animal, um, I'm not going to raise them on people because I'm not. I don't. I don't want to say greed. You know, yeah. I'm not. 
So but, if it doesn't cost you more, you're not going to charge more. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and because the providing people with quality meat is more important to me than making it rich. And um, I realize sometimes that's a terrible business model to have. <laughs> um, but, you know, at the same time, I think our generation today, the generation of the Iraq veterans, the OEF veterans, and we can see through the bullshit. You know, and if someone's not genuine, if and when and not even just the Iraq and Afghanistan veterans and OIF and OEF vets, anybody who's our age, you know, who we can we can see through the bullshit. And if you're not 100 percent real and 100 percent behind your company, I'm not going to support it yeah. you know, because you don't support it yourself. You know, or, you know, if I see. Oh, well, you're just doing that for greed. You know, well, like Bezos. Bezos, <laughs> no. I, you know, I'm, I don't need millions and billions and all that kind of stuff. I just want, uh, I want to provide people with good quality meat, you know. And so, um, yeah. So, so you mentioned, uh, and we, we haven't talked about this mm -hmm. on camera, but since mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned OIF, OEF, so, mm -hmm. so going back, um, you know, just brief on the military career and then kind of getting out of that, like what mm -hmm. led you into farming and stuff like that? Yeah. Um, so I joined in 2005, July of 2005, went to boot camp and, uh, was in the Marine Corps, went to go be a radio operator, uh, ended up going and doing a bunch of other things. And most of us who were, in any time, any branch of the military, uh, we hardly ever actually did the job that we signed <laughs> up to do. And uh, you know, so uh, 06, 07, I was in Iraq. 07, 08, I was in Africa. Uh, operation fell under the Operation Enduring Freedom. Yeah. This is back before they had the Afghanistan ribbon. And you still got like an expedition, you know, uh, or a... Uh, Hell, I can't remember the ribbon. Anyway, yeah. um, and so 708, I was in Africa and was there during the Captain Phillips stuff and, you know, that whole movie, you know, in Africa. <laughs> um, yeah. Because 0709, I was in Iraq, so. Yeah. But you mentioned a movie about yeah, Africa. Yeah, so if you remember, there was, I believe it was in 07. Towards the end of 07, um, there was a ship, a merchant marine ship that had been taken over. And uh, it had been taken over by Somali pirates. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Okay, okay, okay. I was and, like, what are you talking about? Yeah, okay, sorry. I got you, yeah. I got you. And I got a bunch <laughs> of like, thoughts and they all kind of, but eventually, man, we're going to get yeah. there. You know, so, um, <laughs> so anyway, so to kind of fast forward that, I got out in 2009 and I had my own issues. Like everyone else, got a divorce, got, had, you know, kids, all that kind of stuff. And so um, I went to work for the uh, a program called Courage to Call right after I got out because uh, – my biggest thing was veteran advocacy. And at that time, um, I had actually gotten out and I've never, ever told anyone publicly this. So you're the first person I've ever told someone publicly. So I got out with an other than honorable discharge for okay. smoking weed like 30 days right before, you know, it's it yeah. like, this is the last week I was getting out in July. I think it was end of May and you know, your packs already dropped and you know, you just yeah. kind of like, you know, whatever. Ter terminal Lance. Yeah, pretty <laughs> much. Yeah, that's basically what I was. And uh, I didn't really give a shit. And uh, hell, at that point, I think I'd already been through two divorces. And uh, so, so I think this is pretty interesting because okay. all of us are told, and a lot of service members, active duty, mm -hmm. don't realize, and a lot of civilians don't realize that there's seven different types of discharges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most people think there's two. And then while you're in transitioning, even if you're getting out with an honorable, yeah, uh, oftentimes your chain of command makes you feel like you're never going to be successful. 
because you're yeah. not retiring. You know, retirement is pretty much the only way to get out that is kind of viewed in a positive light mm -hmm. from your Absolutely. active chain of command. And so people like me and you who transition from the military, maybe a little bit uh, outside of the norm, so to speak, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, might feel like <laughs> we're never going to have a real job. We're never going to be successful. I'm going to end mm -hmm. up homeless. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet here you are with a successful ranch. Well, and, and see, that's exactly what happened. Um, I think, and like I say, it was a mistake. I make mistakes. I, we all make a mistake and it's how you come back from that mistake and what you learn from that mistake. That's going to determine what that, what your future is. And I, had a choice, uh, but you're exactly right. You know, that whole, um, you know, we're brothers and this and that, you know, that, that same story that everyone talks about, you know, God, country, core, that whole bullshit. And uh, once I popped positive, naturally I did my 25 days in the brig and, and all that. It, it was like, I went hardcore, huh? Yeah. It was, it was like, <laughs> it was like I had, gain leprosy you know like I, i'd been diagnosed with ptsd uh had a slew of other problems along with along with that stuff and that you know hell i could show you all my medical documents and all that kind of stuff but it's a slew of other problems and yeah i don't want to say that like oh wow you know i smoked it at a party yeah. and it just so happened like the next Monday, they threw it. They, you know, they did a piss test. They do, you know, it's, that type of shit happens. But my life was going fucking downhill anyway. Um, and so, you know, that kind of was a turning point for me. Um, but anyway, so back to, uh, I want to finish this thought is, you know, that whole we're brothers, we're always going to be there for each other. That whole uh, alma mater, I guess you could say. As soon as I got out of the brig and I popped positive and all that kind of stuff, it was like I had le I'd gained leprosy. Like yeah. no one would, no one would talk to me, and you know, it's all you you kind of realize like it's all a facade, you know. And um, you know, I still love my country. I still love you know the fact that I was in a that I was in the Marine Corps, and, but that doesn't define who I am. I think it's what I did after I got out that really defines uh, who I am. Um, but I remember, you know, there was this staff sergeant whenever I was getting out and I was signing my separation papers and he was like, you will never be on, you know, you're, you're not a veteran, this and that. You're, you know, you dishonored the Marine Corps, you dishonored your family. And I'm like, look, man, like I was, I actually made it to my EAS and actually stayed in two days after because it was a holiday weekend. And so I got stuck there, you know? And so like, how can you say that I decided I, I'm 30 days before I got out, I made a mistake, you, you know? Yeah. And so, so that kind of drove me because turns out there's a lot of guys, there were a lot of guys who were doing that and using that stuff as a coping mechanism. And so I ended up getting a job uh, at a, you know, for a mental health advocacy courage to call. And like we were talking about, um, was asked to uh, help start the Veterans Treatment Court in San Diego and help them build a mentor team, which the goal of the team was, let's say we're both OIF, OEF vets, probably around the same age. Yeah. And uh, is I would take and we would be given a caseload and I'd have to take, I'd match you up with someone that was like service era, you know, so that you have stuff in common with them and someone who was successful and unsuccessful, you know, yeah. you had someone who made a mistake and someone who's successful and um, peer support. Yeah. Peer support. Yeah, yeah exactly. The, yeah. And so I was um, trying to think of what it was called. Was like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so I did that. And then um, I think I just got tired. I got tired of everyone, got tired of shouldering everyone's burdens, you know, because I was dealing with my own stuff as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's when I got into farming and working greenhouses in California. And I met my wife and her family is great. And they're all, 
they're all from Hawaii and natural hippie, you know, kind of. And so um, it really influenced the, my path, you know, mm-hmm. and um, and so I st- got started farming and I've been that was in 2011. And I've been doing it ever since. That's I love it. There's something about being with an animal or being with a plant. You know, they depend on you. You know, they 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 only have you to survive. And they were you know they they and so for me, it was it almost became I don't want to say spiritual, but something that really took off a lot of stress. You know, in in other areas of my life and things that I was working through personally, and uh, and so. Ultimately, the goal is, you know, that I'll be able to retire doing this. I'll be able to teach my kids how to do it. I will be able to, uh, you know, our our family name will live on and leave a legacy for my kids. And yeah, that's, yeah, that's kind (laughs) of, yeah, we kind of dove into that one pretty quick. (laughs) No, that's that's all right. Um, Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't know if a lot of people on this show know, but on the veteran talk show, um, I got a general, mm-hmm. so, uh, re- really in, cause I was able to use my GI bill, mm-hmm. um, cause they were trying to give me an OTH, but I got a set board yep. cause I had been in for more than six years mm-hmm. and the colonel bumped it up to a general. So, uh, it says general under honorable conditions. Yeah. So. Uh, because I got full benefits because I was in for 10 years. I served mm-hmm. two out of three contracts with full honorable. Um, you know, there's not much difference between me and someone with a honorable discharge, except uh, my DD-214, the RE code, uh, re- reenlistment eligibility, and mm-hmm. the chapter and yeah. the rank I got out outside mm-hmm. of that. So obviously, because I tried to get back in, for three yeah. years after I got out, I tried the army, I tried the Marines, tried the Coast Guard, tried the reserves. Yeah. Um, couldn't get back in after three years. They want you to go back through basic. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, now I'm fat and old and ain't gonna drink happen. too much beer. So yeah, that's it. Um yeah. Yeah, well, and um yeah, I've I've thought about upgrading and you know, the reason I don't think I have is because you know, at one point, in at one point, it was the government. You kind of felt not to get like you kind of felt used and abused, you know. And then they were just like, "All right, well, you fucked up this one time, we're done." So, no. you know, and so I've kind of always had it in my head that, um, well, fuck them. They don't need me. I don't need them. And I'm not going to upgrade, and I'm not doing the VA shit, and. You know, since then I've I've I'm in the VA and all that. Yeah. You know, there were some <laughs> things that previously happened, and my wife was like, "Some shit is not right, and you need to go talk to someone." <laughs> you know, so well, you I mean, you had two deployments, so it's like you know, yeah. I I never went to Afghanistan when I was in Iraq. Like I was on BBC, so mm-hmm. you know, we had Cinnabon and Toby Keith and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so I wasn't out there like the buddy I talked about near the Syrian border where things are. I mean, we got blown up. We took IDF on one of the courthouses and mm-hmm. um, there plenty of small arms fire and some EFPs. Uh, yeah. Luckily, you know, we came, we left 100%, came back 100%. But I, I'm not trying to downplay my deployment, but in comparison wow. to what some of the Marines I know saw, it was, yeah. it was nothing. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I don't know. The, the way that I, I don't really have a way that I look at that. I look at all of us have our own experience and, and your experience, you know, it's your experience. Oh. It, it doesn't compare to mine and, and not in a bad way. You know, you don't, you shouldn't have to compare yourself. You, you shouldn't, no one should be like, man, well, my, my deployment I wasn't doing what you guys were doing, so mine didn't mean. You know what I mean? Does that well, make sense? Yeah, I'm, and I mean, in in a sense of PTSD, like they told mm-hmm. me I had it when I got out. Yeah. Um, and I'm pretty sure that's because I had deployed. Yeah. Um, didn't really have 
like a lot of the more extreme symptoms that yeah. come with that. Yeah. Um, applied for the disability through the VA and got denied mm -hmm. uh, recently with the help of a local veteran company. I was mm -hmm. able to, you know, kind of make up for that and increase my disability rating. But uh, if I were to give you like a more uh, tangible analogy, yeah. Um, if I had bad dreams, it would be that uh, Taco Bell didn't have shredded cheese. You know, the goat <laughs> like, cheese, the goat like, cheese. I'm just saying, <laughs> when you, when you went up to the Victory Base Complex and you mm -hmm. went over to the PX, like it's this giant, uh, huge store, mm -hmm. and they had they had the the tea barriers and Hesco barriers all along the outside, and yeah. you had this this big walkway, and then you had the tents with the picnic tables and you had the bazaar and then you had cell phone internet you had the the so shop so you could literally like when you walk through there if you walked around the half circle on the outside of the mm -hmm. px mm -hmm. it was just whatever you want like yeah. pizza hut taco bell Jeez. like people like you look at me and they're like you are that is crazy like that's not a deployment that's like you went to a really hot place for a long time. Again. Yeah, yeah, you, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? While, now, yeah. we rolled outside the wire every day. Uh, mm -hmm. We did a supply run. Um, I, I think it was Tataji. Uh, so, Sergeant Major Cook Defect was one of my favorite mm -hmm. defects. We did uh, a mission pretty often called the Green Door. We would pick up some judge and move him to. I think we were taking them to a courthouse or something. Mm -hmm. um, we ran the Iraqi High Tribunal, okay. which was its own compound inside of a fob inside of the green zone. Yep. But we still had to get there. So we're, done, yeah. we're going down Route Irish to get there. Yeah. Um, so I did all kinds of stuff. But at the end of the day, when I was at home in Iraq, yeah. Uh, a mile or so down the road was that there was PX. PX Taco so Bell. It's, so it's like they yeah. would set up a stage and have yeah. uh, musicians and stuff come in and like, mm -hmm. it's like, <laughs> you're, you're not on the Syrian border, like, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So. Well, uh, what, so were you there when they uh, hung Saddam? Uh, no, no, no. Um, but if I, so I walked in, I walked through the death house uh, where he got executed. Really? Yeah. So that was Operation Silver Scorpion. Mm -hmm. um, and no Americans are allowed to be in there yeah. while they're running it. Um, really? But Operation Silver Scorpion, because I was an MP. Yeah. Uh, so Operation Silver Scorpion, we handled everything up to the door. Mm. Um, so we ran that a few times. Uh, I tell people, that I have boots with his blood on them. Yeah. I, I yeah. walk below the gallows. Yeah. And you know how Iraqis clean, like they spray water. Yeah, so. they spray water. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, but uh, we we went up there and we like pulled the lever and listened to it. Uh, I was looking for pictures and videos of it because I had them on a hard drive, but that thing is so old. But yeah, so I wasn't there, while, but I met his half brother, mm -hmm. uh, his uncle. Uh, I'm See, I, re I remember, because I was there when he got hung, not in Baghdad, but it was like videos just immediately no. started. I remember watching it the day he got hung and was just like, this is amazing. You, yeah. you know, I mean, that, I think that was, I don't even know if like you would even like say I felt victory, you know, and, no. uh, you know, um, yeah, I got a piece of uh, the marble from his palace. Oh, that's Vic awesome. Victory over America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's badass. <laughs> that we yeah. put a JDM through. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a good time, but mm -hmm. um, it was very cush in comparison. So, uh, but yeah, yeah. That definitely, uh, I like that you were kind of able to take that experience and uh, use it with the uh, courage to call and mm -hmm. the the courts that you talked about yeah I've, I've heard of those before yeah uh, i didn't know they expanded to san diego but, yeah um i i guess being able to kind of pilot that program mm -hmm. um and then you you also talk about taking care of the animals and the plants and it kind of seems like that's a unorthodox unorthodox version of therapy for you it, it, it really is and i think um I don't want to get on like my medication soapbox, hmm. 
Um, but I think in lieu of a lot of the medications that they give people and that are people are prescribed, all you, if you think about it, all you really need is something to take your mind off of it at that time. Yeah. You know, wouldn't and not to say like, oh, well, I'm having a flashback or my PTSD. But you know, you start legitimately start thinking about stuff, and you know, it makes you sad or or depresses you. All you really do is you you need to find something else. Uh, yeah, I used to train a lot. I worked out at the gym. Uh, I've kind of gone from working out to training to Muay Thai to MMA to Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> I've done it all just to, in the pursuit of how can I um, free my mind and kind of take take my attention off of this. And um, boy, it was like once I got into farming and well, of course now naturally a ranch, but you know, we talked about the definition, definition of those too. <laughs> um, but it was, it was just like, it's something that I feel a calling to do. It's, um, I'm more, I don't want to, it sounds so stupid, it? but I, I'm like, you feel one with nature. You feel yeah. connected to your ancestors. We are doing things today that people did 50, 60, 70, a hundred years yeah. ago. And that's amazing. And if, um, a lot of, I, I think a lot of people have forgotten where their food comes from outside of it just shows up in a grocery store and you know, it's important to remind people because if we don't have ranchers, we don't have farmers, there is no food. You no. know, you can say, well, you know, I think I saw in China they were doing a 3D, you know, you they figured out how to 3D print food. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you honestly have to... I think I think we as a people need to get back to our roots, and we need to. Um, you know, we can't forget where we came from, you know, in terms of our food and the way we consume it, and um, just to get a deal, just to get a sale. You 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 know, eat quality meat, eat quality food. There are tons of farmers out there who are just breaking even just to put food on everyone else's plate no. and i'll tell you this when people think they're a bunch of farmers that are rich and we make a bunch of money it ain't that ain't that ain't the case no it ain't us who's making it. it's the person that we're selling it to or the person you know like if i sell it to food line food line is going to be the one making the money on that i'm going to be taking a cut because well i want food line to buy three, 400 pounds of meat because, well, that, you know, that puts more money in my pocket at a lot at one time, if, no. if that makes sense, um, versus me selling it individually. And we did, we had meat in stores and stuff like that, but I got to thinking about it and I'm like, well, wait a second. So if this store decides to walk away, what am I going to do? I've got a business. I've got my life savings invested in this. What am I going to do? How, how will we survive? And um, so that's where we started selling to the individual customer because we want to, you know, we want to kind of want to have that pyramid, that good, solid base, good, solid customer base, and, you know, grow it from there. That way, if, and I don't want to lose a customer, I never want to lose a customer, and it hurts if I do. Um, but, if we do, we've still got a solid base. We will still be there. We will, we are sustainable. We're not going anywhere. And, um, yeah, I think that's, that's just a very important thing to, to say right there, you know, because uh, a lot of people, you know, they, they forget where their food comes from and, you know, you got to support local people. You got to support local businesses or else, well, what else do you have? <laughs> Food Line, Walmart, and Target, and Jeff Bezos and his whole army <laughs> freaking run, run shit? Yeah. Ain't going. No. We need to do it ourselves. Yeah. And ain't no so, sense in everyone getting rich. 
So with uh, basically with all the um, animals that you handle, I mean, we talked about this a little bit before. Mm -hmm. I think it was off camera, like the difference between uh, the advantages with goats and cows and what you have and like what people, I, I know you talked a lot about cuts. Yeah. You, know, you had mentioned one that I've never heard of. So yeah. tell yeah. me a little bit about like the different meats or animals and cuts and oh man, how all that works. Wow. Um, so you have basically, uh, and I hope, I hope I'm going to answer your question properly. So, so if you split, you know, an animal in say four quadrants, you know, say four quarters, you have four quarters, you got two shoulders, two, two hind legs, one tenderloin, and you've got all the meat, the ribs and stuff like that, two ribs. And, um, so the thing that I've, that I've realized is that goats are, they cost a lot to raise. You don't necessarily get a lot out of them. And, They've gotten really popular and people like to raise them and um, especially meat goats have gotten really, really popular. As a matter of fact, there was an article that I read a while back, I believe it was in a goat rancher magazine where they were saying that the U.S. can't, they have to get goat meat. The population of goat ranchers in the United States cannot fill the demand for the meat. And that's the reason. Really? Yeah. Yeah. The, the reason is, is because you may only get, you know, goat weighs, what, 300, say 250 to 350. It's kind of where they range from. You're going to get 50, 60, 70% back on the meat. You're naturally going to lose stuff to fat and all that kind of stuff. And so you may get back 150 pounds of meat. Well, that takes a lot of goats to fill that demand. But what they don't tell you, though, is a goat is one of the biggest parasite resistant or parasite susceptible to parasite animal that you can have outside of like a horse or something like that. And um, they are expensive to raise. Um, and it's not us like one is valued you're getting like three four hundred dollars for one and someone's buying at a sale they're taking it up to a feed lot in pennsylvania and they're feeding it out for like another month two months on some high protein feed and then it goes to slaughter and then it gets it gets processed and it gets sent out to wherever you also have a local community that typically will you know they'll buy one and slaughter and stuff like that but there's a lot of I think since that article has come out and things that I've noticed is there's a lot of uh, new goat ranchers that are coming in and I 100% support that. Um, and so it's, uh, that's driven the price down. You know, cattle and all meat right now is high. All animals right now are high. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I can keep a, cow for just as long as I would keep a goat and I would take and I can make three and four times on that cow um, because I have a market for it because we have a customer base for it I don't have a customer base for me mm. you know, or I'm sorry for goat meat yeah. and um, and so to me it just didn't seem profitable um, to continue to have them because it costs something like a thousand dollars a year to raise one, hmm. you know, it's significantly less with cattle. Um, and you, keep in mind that's not to say, oh well, you know, like I'm over, I'm not overcharging anyone. I'm just, you know, I'm trying to figure out ways to make things more cost efficient for everyone. Yeah, and on a small, on a small <laughs> time scale. Yeah, we're never gonna. Well, I don't know. I'd like to be big one day, but, you know, who, who knows? So I I think that, does that, does yeah. that answer that? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm always curious because, like I said, I got that buddy that does goats. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about a completely different economy. Yeah. Completely different country. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Um, so there's, uh, like, we went down there to visit. Mm -hmm. It was kind of funny. I'm like, hey, man, we're coming to Puerto Rico. They're not. 
<laughs> I was yeah. like, what? He was like, no, it's way better in the Dominican Republic. I was like, all right, we'll come to the Dominican Republic. Hell yeah. She didn't have a passport, so we had to jump through some hoops there, make, mm-hmm. make sure we knocked that out. But mm-hmm. we flew down, and I saw it. And um, I, I feel like I, I don't know a lot about the country and the culture and the economy, but mm-hmm. I feel like there are some very noticeable differences um, between, like, entrepreneurship here mm-hmm. and, <clears throat> and there. Um, here, it, it's almost like entrepreneurship is cool. Yeah. Like, you start your own business. I yeah. sell online. I do, you know, grow plants, whatever. Whatever mm-hmm. it is. Down there, it's more like, no, we just need to do whatever it is we need to do to either feed our families or make money. Absolutely. So you you still have uh, very poor and very wealthy. You still mm-hmm. have the different classes. You still have people who don't do anything all day and people who go to work all day. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of similarities in that. But basically what I'm getting at is with him starting with the goats, and I've talked to him, he's got uh, – some land, mm-hmm. um, which I think that is a little bit rare. Yeah. Uh, but he also kind of has the advantage of being, he's got Puerto Rican family and Dominican family. Mm-hmm. And they're very, very large on both sides. So mm-hmm. um, I don't think land ownership per se is very big in the Dominican Republic. I think it's it's one of those things that's like, it's it's not as easy Yeah. Uh, yeah. for everyone, yeah. at least down there. And so... That's that's what I think one of the differences might be, and I'd, mm-hmm. I'd love to talk to him, like, kind of in comparison, because you talk about how here, it's almost like it's oversaturated. Yeah. The market is oversaturated, so yeah. I, that's where I see some of the differences, like, down there, it's not as bad as it is, because yeah. he's the only one I saw, because I was like, who else is raising goats? And he was like, well, there's there's some. Yeah. You know, but he pretty much knows everybody that does it. Well, and if you have to think of it, if, if you, well, not if you have to, if you think about it, culturally, it's also different too. Um, Americans, we are, for the most part, are not raised to eat goat meat. You know, I've no. never heard of eating goat meat up until, well, when I got into farming is when I heard of it. <laughs> um, and, you know, and so, but in other cultures, you know, Mexican, Dominican Republic, um, Iraq, Afghanistan, oh yeah, Africa, yeah. all of that. They're raised on it because it's a cheap. At that time, it was a cheap animal to raise. Now it's not a cheap animal to yeah. raise, but at that time it was. As a matter of fact, uh, the Kiko, which is the goat that I raised, they actually are from New Zealand, huh. and how they ended up coming up with them is they took a, they took a bunch of goats. And they put them on top of a mountain. Excuse me. They, t- they put them on top of a mountain, a mountain and they left them. Yeah. They said the ones who survive will survive. <laughs> and the ones who don't, don't. And out of that, you have how the New Zealand Kiko goat came from. Oh. Yeah. And they were they're a mountain goat. Now, as the years have gone... Us as ranchers and farmers and livestock owners, you know, the genetics have kind of been watered down a little. I don't want to say watered down, but naturally the, they develop an immunity yeah. to the initial, you know, dewormers and stuff that you would give them in order to keep them healthy. So, so they're still an incredibly good parasite resistant animal. Um, but it still takes a lot of work. There's a lot of, you, you have to stay on top of them way more than you have to stay on top of a cow. And as we talked about before, I have a full-time job. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to run a business. I'm trying to provide meat to customers. So a lot of times, so I work 12 hour shifts a lot of times. And as of late, because of the holidays, we haven't been real busy, but I suspect we're going to get busy here soon. I'll wake up about three in the morning, go feed all the animals, go pack my orders for the day, then go work a 12 hour shift at work. And then after I get off work at seven o'clock at night, I will go around and personally deliver those orders. And so then I'm home by 
eight thirty, nine o'clock at night. And then I go and I feed the animals again, check on all of them, <laughs> make sure they're all safe and ain't no one got their head stuck somewhere. One of them ain't done something stupid for the day. Um, because where you raise livestock, hell, them damn things will. What are you want to talk about? A damn frustrated <laughs> animal boy. Well, I'm telling you, I have one animal, <laughs> one puppy, uh-huh. and he is 15 pounds, mm-hmm. and that is that is it. That is as big as that guy is going to get. And we still, so she works from home, so she'll work at her desk in the corner of her room. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and I'll come home and I go up there, and she's she's working. Yeah, she's making phone calls. She's doing, you know. Uh, maybe Zoom meetings. For, I, I don't know. She's got two screens up there and got got tons of work. My wife does the same thing. Yeah. I come to the top of the stairs and this dude got something, <clears throat> and there's just like stuffing. Oh, yeah. it looks like <laughs> it looks like it snowed in the room, uh-huh. except for right by her. And I'll come up and she'll turn around. And she'll be like, "What is this?" So. So that's just one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can't imagine having a whole ranch full of yeah. animals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, luckily, you know, um, I like. I would like to think of myself a pretty smart person. My wife may disagree with me, but you know how we'll agree to disagree on that. Um, and so I think over the years I've learned, you know, the best ways and best practices to keep animals in. And, you know, like where a lot of people will... Um, we use electrical fence on everything. Um, and that's one of the, our biggest deterrents, but a lot of people will keep like a three strand, four strand, four foot tall fence. Well, you ever seen an animal, you know, cows can jump. A damn goat can jump five, six foot. You know, a cow can, can clear a fence too. If they really, you know, they really put their mind to it. So all our fences are six foot fences. Mm. And we run six strands of, of hot wire. And, you know, in that way, we're not disturbing our neighbors. Our animals aren't getting out. And, and I mean, we don't have a whole lot of neighbors anyway. I kind of, I think like we were talking about before, I kind of, once I got into the farming industry, um, I kind of, you know, went back to like living off the grid, right. off the grid kind of living. And, uh, you know, but I don't want to be a nuisance to my neighbors, regardless of how close or far away they yeah. are. <laughs> you know, so, um, and, you know, we invest a lot of money in these animals and they're well taken care of. They're well maintained. I constantly watch them. Um, the biggest thing that I will say is I would say it's our biggest claim to fame, you know, but, and I'll explain to you why. Our animals eat what I give them. They eat. They, you know, top quality, you know, coastal Bermuda hay, and they eat only grain that, you know, I've developed, you know, with a knowledge base of, um, you know, how much protein, protein content, fiber content, um, potassium content, magnesium <clears throat> content, all that stuff that it takes you, me, and an animal to grow. The reason for that is number one is I have a controlled 100% closed herd. There are no diseases. There are, there is no health issues running around because I control it. And the only thing they get is from me. The other reason for that is the parasite resistance. Um, The parasite resistance is incredibly high because they're not eating off the ground. You know, they get parasites from eating on the ground and grazing, you know, grazing, say, below three inches. Um, mine don't even, they eat some grass, but they definitely ain't eating it down past three inches. And uh, so we provide that to them in order to raise a healthy animal, a quality animal, and to ensure that when I tell you this is the quality of it, that it's going to be, that is the quality that you're going to get. And I can 100% guarantee you that. And if there's something, an issue wrong with it, I can promise you we'll make it right. So how, you mentioned it about the grazing. They eat what you give them. They don't graze past three inches. Like, I guess, because I haven't been there. So like, how do you know? 
How do I know? Or, or how do you control that? Well, the thing is, is so, take a look at it like this kid in a candy store, right? Um, or, well, kid at the dinner table. A kid at the dinner table who knows they're not getting any, any dessert, they're just going to eat their food. But a kid who knows they're going to get some dessert at the end, they're going to try to do little tricks and stuff like that to get that candy. Now, which would you prefer? Would you prefer to eat a salad or would you prefer to eat a steak? And the same exact thing. A cow is the same exact way and an animal is the same exact way. If I'm constantly giving it stuff, high quality stuff that it would prefer over grass, it's going to stay off that grass just like us. So, so they still like pick a little bit, but they're like, oh, I want the good stuff. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, they still. They still graze. Hell, we got we got 19 acres on one area, and then we got another 60 acre farm lease. And so they do still graze. They they are out in the open. They, we don't have them caged up, nothing like that. But I can guarantee you, all of them come come to a feed bucket. You know, and they're all nice animals, and I treat them all quality. There is not one that gets mistreated. I'm a huge animals rights advocate, and don't mistreat animals. You don't mistreat animals. Livestock, dogs, pets, nothing, you know. And um, you know, so like I say, all ours are I I definitely try to keep a you know, I've I've, I've set the bar very high. I think it's I think it's because when I as a kid, um I always wanted to be the best of the best. That's why I joined the Marine Corps, because I consider the best of the best, you know, it's even in the slogan. The few, the proud. Oh man, that's cool dress blues. <laughs> um, and so I've always strived to have that, you know, best of the best. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. And I'm going to do it to where it would make my father proud. It would make my grandfather proud. And there's no one along the line. So you can look back and say, you know, from wherever they are. And say he didn't do the best that he could. You no, know what I mean? It's no. I'm I'm a huge kind of old way of thinking kind of, and I don't want to say old. I'm like I would like to think of myself as very progressive. Um, but at the same way, you know, like there are some things that are established in me that man, I just it's like it's like it drives you. You know, you you no. own a business, no. it drives you. You you can't get enough of it. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's that shit is the best drug you'll ever get. You know, when you feel that success, you feel that moment. You know, like uh, I had someone come by yesterday and buy 13 goats. Boy, you were talking about you know, <laughs> you're checking these goats one, two times a week. You're trimming their hooves. You're making sure they're getting the shots. They're making sure that they're getting healthy hay, a healthy source of feed you know you're doing everything for these animals and someone comes by and pays top dollar for them when the when the price is down right now because we just got done with the holiday and all that kind of stuff well you know that, that, <laughs> that feeling of the, like the success like yeah. yeah man that's like a drug you can't <laughs> it's it's hard to replicate that when i can you know so um but yeah that's 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 why we do what we do. And um, I hope everyone, I hope I've maybe convinced a couple of people to give us a call. Yeah. So. so, so how does that work? Cause I mean, when you think about going to a restaurant, you know, you get a menu. So is it like, you know, do you have a website or is there, do people pick out what they want? Do they call you? Do they fill out a form? Do they email? Like, what does that look like? It's really simple. It's almost like we're back in the Stone Age. Um, <laughs> or in the MySpace days, if you can remember. Maybe mm-hmm. even some music playing on our Facebook page. We don't have a website. Um, look, I'm a, I'm a farmer and a rancher. <laughs> I, I don't know how to do any of that shit. And I ain't going to pretend like I do. But we do have a Facebook page that myself and my wife will look after. And um, you can look us up at Bare Knuckle Farms. And we're also on Instagram. My wife, man, you know, uh, my wife take, made sure I got on Instagram and all that kind of stuff. And we're at Bare Knuckle Farms NC there 
And uh, you can send a message. There's also a uh, phone number listed on the website or on the Facebook page where you can give me a call, give it a call, and it rings right to my phone. Okay. Anyway, so if you want to debate with me about grain fed, <laughs> grass fed, the difference in, and all that kind of stuff, by all means, give me a call. I'll be glad to sit down and talk to you. Hell, you can even come out. Um, so once there, like I said, give us a call, shoot us a message from our Facebook page. <clears throat> uh, once again, at Bare Knuckle Farms. And most of the time you're talking to me, and you can look on there. We'll have a price list available. Um, and then um, you can reach out and say, okay, what do you currently have? Because sometimes we don't always have steak. We don't always have, you know, the different cuts. You know, because once we process, you know, people buy a lot of that stuff, you know, quickly. And so um, they'll say, okay, well, what do you have? And I'll send them a list of here's everything that we have. Here's the price per pound. And then you can kind of take it from there. Um, if it's within kind of the Raleigh Fayetteville area, uh, we deliver it with a minimum $50 order or like a $10 delivery fee. I live down in Sanford. I drive a diesel. <laughs> gas is expensive. Oh. And you know, so I will I'll bring it straight to your door. I'll bring it to your business. Wherever you ask me to come, you know, outside of like some sketchy place, you know, uh, with Dirty Mike and the boys, I, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, you'll be meeting with me. You have a question about and And then even then, we've had some people who can say, who have said, hey, we really want to come and take a look at your animals before we purchase the meat and, and, and ensure that you are who you say you are. And so you're welcome. People obviously make an appointment. Don't just show up at my house. You know, <laughs> my house. you know, make an appointment. You can come by. I'll introduce you to the animals. You can pet them and stuff like that. And I'll let you see what we feed them. And, um, you know, and we're, we really want people to have a connection to what we're trying to do. And um, that way we're all successful together because, you know, like we said, uh, what you get in, what you put in is what you get out. And uh, if we can grow this as a community, um, that would be a great thing. You know, yeah. and if we can, we can kick these places out like Food Lion and Walmart, the Walmarts and all that kind of stuff out of our community and we support ourselves. You know, the majority of what we get today comes from China and is outsourced out of the country. When we have people here who have the ability to do it, um, but it's not happening because people are going to those big box stores. Oh. And so if you, you know, kind of change your mindset, say, hey, you know, work a little bit. I don't want to say work a little bit harder, but okay, so every Sunday I need to see Matt. I need Matt, I need to, on Friday or Saturday, I need to contact Matt at Bare Knuckle Farms let him know the meat that I want. Make sure he, and, and ask him if he can deliver it. And then you don't even have to leave the grocery store. There, I know there are other businesses you know, that we've all run into uh, where they, specifically, I know there's even some here where you know, they deliver boxes of vegetables, you know, and for a weekly or monthly or whatever. You can kind of pay a subscription fee. There's all that kind of stuff. And I think people, I don't want to make a broad assumption like people, um, but I think we've gotten used to convenience. But if you kind of Google a little bit or, you know, ask some questions or kind of look around, you know, depend on, you know, look into the Facebook, various Facebook groups and stuff that are out there. There's plenty of us local business owners who would love to have your, business we shoot man my family you know that's how i feed my family yeah you know and it's it's something that i love you know, i can guarantee that so yeah. yeah well it's it's crazy man i mean i didn't i didn't i didn't know something it, i guess you could say as small as your ranch exists because mm -hmm. you always think of farms like I, I 
I guess because there's not that open line of communication, it's yeah. like you, it, it's not as easy to just go out. Or I mean, one time a while back, I was slinging a uh, business phone service. Yeah, and we drove up to like a farmhouse and started talking to people, and it was, I think they called it a hobby farm. Mm-hmm. So they don't do anything close to what you do. There. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I was yeah, like, yeah. I was like, I don't understand what do you mean. And they yeah. were like, Well, we live here. Yeah, and this is all for fun, <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, okay." Yeah. So uh, it was it was pretty crazy, but uh, uh, a lot more of the the sports and stuff like that as mm-hmm. it relates to the animals. Um, yeah. So just kind of that disconnect, and then you know, you brought up the the vegetables and whatnot. So mm-hmm. I'm I'm glad you came up here because now it's like you know now you know that a local rancher exists, absolutely, um, where you can if the quality of the meats and how the animals are cared for is something that concerns you as an individual, but you're still purchasing in the big box stores. Mm -hmm. And now you can change your purchasing decisions based off of your own kind of ideologies and beliefs um, and support local small businesses. So uh, that's, that's pretty exciting. I, I, I appreciate so. you I educating so. yeah, us and, yeah. and coming up here and taking yeah. the time out. So, I th- I, you know, you already talked about it a little bit, but like main line of communication, most important place, uh, where, where can people find you? Find us on Facebook. Find us on Instagram. We are there. Um, and Bear Knuckle Farms. Uh, Bear Knuckle Farms, uh, two words or three words. And actually... Uh, no one else knows this except for my wife, uh, but the name and logo and all that kind of stuff will actually be changing, uh, to Bear Knuckle Cattle Company. Uh, the reason for that is I think a lot of people get us confused with a farm and, Mm. you know, which is the definition of, we don't put anything in the ground in order to get, you know, fruits and vegetables from it. So we're technically not a farm. We are technically a ranch. And, um, so that will be changing soon, but for right now, find us at Bare Knuckle Farms. Find us at, on Instagram at Bare Knuckle Farms NC. Um, we're not on Twitter because that is an absolute shit show. <laughs> um, and and you can you know and yeah, just look us up, get with us, shoot us a message. Both me and my wife are highly personable. Um, I can talk your ear off for hours about ranching and, you know, China and all that kind of stuff. We can sit and we can have a wonderful conversation about it if you so choose. And, uh, yeah, you know, reach out to us, get us, you know, become a customer, give us a chance, you yeah. know, at least give us a, give us a chance to, uh, to show you the difference. You know, cool. So, yeah. Well, thanks for coming out, man. Of course, man. Thank you. This is the Veteran Talk Show. If you or someone you love is suffering as a victim of sexual harassment, sexual assault, needs help with addiction and recovery, or mental health and well-being, then please go to VeteranTalkShow.com slash resources. This show is hosted, produced, and edited by Ryan Smeltz. Our co-host is Joe Ballack and a guest starring veterans.